brought to you by Charity Mobile, the phone company that sends 5% of your monthly plan price to your favorite charity. No contracts, nationwide coverage, risk-free guarantee. Learn more at CharityMobile.com. In light of the story that I covered recently of the Anglican priests and bishops, including a lady bishop, offering the Mass, their version of the Mass, at St. John Lateran, with full permission of the Holy See, who then later said, well, this was a miscommunication issue. And then they announced that they were going to allow another priest from a schismatic group to offer the Mass at St. John Lateran or at another facility in Rome. I thought it would be good for us to revisit the question of Anglican holy orders because there's been some you know, debate about how valid they are. I'm sure you know, those who hold to Anglicanism believe that they are valid orders. The Church has ruled consistently for five centuries now that that's not the case. So Pope Leo XIII issued just over 130 years ago or so a document explaining why they're not valid. It is a history document. The first third of the document goes over the history of the question, how the question was examined in the 16th century by veterans of the Council of Trent and by the various popes of the time, before then going into the real meat and potatoes of the question, which is the form and substance of the sacrament as offered by the Anglicans. So let me know what you think of this at the end. God bless. Apostolicae Curae on the Nullity of Anglican Orders by Pope Leo XIII, 1896, in perpetual remembrance. We have dedicated to the welfare of the noble English nation no small portion of the apostolic care and charity, by which, helped by his grace, we endeavor to fulfill the office and follow in the footsteps of the great pastor of the sheep, our Lord Jesus Christ. The letter which last year we sent to the English seeking the kingdom of Christ in the unity of the faith as a special witness of our goodwill towards England. In it we recalled the memory of the ancient union of the people with Mother Church, and we strove to hasten the day of a happy recollection by stirring up men's hearts to offer diligent prayer to God. And again, more recently, when it seemed good to us to treat more fully the unity of the Church in a general letter, England had not last the last place in our mind, in the hope that our teaching might both strengthen Catholics and bring the saving light to those divided from us. It is pleasing to acknowledge the generous way in which our zeal and plainness of speech, inspired by no mere human motives, have met the approval of the English people. And this testifies not less to their courtesy than to the solicitude for many for their eternal salvation. With the same mind and intention, we now have determined to turn our consideration to a matter of no less importance, which is closely connected with the same subject and our desire. For an opinion already prevalent, confirmed more than once by the action and constant practice of the Church, maintained that when in England, shortly after it was rent from the center of Christian unity, a new right for conferring holy orders was publicly introduced under Edward VI, the true sacrament of order as instituted by Christ elapsed, and with it the hierarchical succession. For some time, however, and in these last years especially, a controversy has sprung up as to whether the sacred orders conferred according to the Edward and ordinal possess the nature and effect of a sacrament. Those in favor of the absolute validity, or of a doubtful validity, being not only certain Anglican writers, but some ca few Catholics, chiefly not English. The consideration of the excellency of the Christian priesthood moved Anglican writers in this matter. Desirous as they were that their own people should not lack the twofold power of over the body of Christ, Catholic writers were impelled by a wish to smooth the way for the return of Anglicans to holy unity. Both indeed thought that in view of studies brought up to the level of recent research and of new documents rescued from oblivion, it was not inopportune to re-examine the question by our authority. And we, not disregarding such desires and opinions, above all obeying the dictates of apostolic charity, have considered that nothing should be left untried that might in any way tend to preserve souls from injury or procure their advantage. It has therefore pleased us to graciously permit the cause to be re-examined, so that through the extreme care taken in the new examination, all doubt or even shadow of doubt should be removed from the future. To this end, we commissioned a certain number of men noted for their learning and ability, whose opinions in this matter were known to be divergent, to state the grounds of their judgment in writing. We then, having summoned them to our person, directed them to interchange writings and further to investigate and discuss all that was necessary for a full knowledge of the matter. 
We were careful also that they should be able to re-examine all documents bearing on this question, which were known to exist in the Vatican archives, to search for new ones, and even to have at their disposal all acts relating to the subject which are preserved by the Holy See, or as it is called, the Supreme Council, and to consider whatever had up to this time been adduced by learned men on both sides. We ordered them, when prepared in this way, to meet together in special sessions. These, to the number of twelve, were held under the presidency of one of the cardinals of the Holy Roman Church, appointed by ourself, and all were invited to free discussion. Finally, we directed that the acts of these meetings, together with all other documents, should be submitted to our venerable brethren, the cardinals of the same council, so that when all had studied the whole subject and discussed it in our presence, each might give his own opinion. The order for discussing the matter having been determined upon, it was necessary, with a view to forming a true estimate of the real state of the question, to enter upon it, after careful inquiry as to how the matter stood in relation to the prescription and settled custom of the Apostolic See, the origin and force of which custom it was undoubtedly of great importance to determine. Apostolicae Curae on the Nullity of Anglican Orders by Pope Leo XIII, 1896 In Perpetual Remembrance We have dedicated to the welfare of the noble English nation no small portion of the apostolic care and charity by which, helped by his grace, we endeavor to fulfill the office and follow in the footsteps of the great pastor of the sheep, our Lord Jesus Christ. The letter which last year we sent to the English, seeking the kingdom of Christ in the unity of the faith, is a special witness of our goodwill towards England. In it we recalled the memory of the ancient union of the people with Mother Church, and we strove to hasten the day of a happy recollection by stirring up men's hearts to offer diligent prayer to God. And again, more recently, when it seemed good to us to treat more fully the unity of the church in a general letter, England had not last the last place in our mind, and the hope that our teaching might both strengthen Catholics and bring the saving light to those divided from us. It is pleasing to acknowledge the generous way in which our zeal and pl plainness of speech, inspired by no mere human motives, have met the approval of the English people, and this testifies not less to their courtesy than to the solicitude for many for their eternal salvation. The same mind and intention we now have determined to turn our consideration to a matter of no less importance, which is closely connected with the same subject and our desire. For an opinion already prevalent, confirmed more than once by the action and constant practice of the Church, maintained that when in England, shortly after it was rent from the center of Christian unity, a new right for conferring holy orders was publicly introduced under Edward VI, the true sacrament of order as instituted by Christ elapsed, and with it the hierarchical succession. For some time, however, and in these last years especially, controversy has sprung up as to whether the sacred orders conferred according to the Edward and Ordinal possessed the nature and effect of a sacrament, those in favor of the absolute validity, or of a doubtful validity, being not only certain Anglican writers, but some ca few Catholics, chiefly not English. The consideration of the excellency of the Christian priesthood moved Anglican writers in this matter, desirous as they were that their own people should not lack the twofold power of over the body of Christ. Catholic writers were impelled by a wish to smooth the way for the return of Anglicans to holy unity. Both indeed thought that in view of studies brought up to the level of recent research and of new documents rescued from oblivion, it was not inopportune to re-examine the question by our authority. And we, not disregarding such desires and opinions, above all, obeying the dictates of apostolic charity, have considered that nothing should be left untried that might in any way tend to preserve souls from injury or procure their advantage. It has therefore pleased us to graciously permit the cause to be re-examined, so that through the extreme care taken in the new examination, all doubt or even shadow of doubt should be removed from the future. To this end, we commissioned a certain number of men noted for their learning and ability whose opinions in this matter were known to be divergent, to state the grounds of their judgment in writing. We then, having summoned them to our person, directed them to interchange writings and further to investigate and discuss all that was necessary for a full knowledge of the matter. We were careful also that they should be able to re-examine all documents bearing on this question, which were known to exist in the Vatican archives, to search for new ones, and even to have at their disposal all acts relating to the subject which are preserved by the Holy See, or as it is called, the Supreme Council, and to consider whatever had up to this time been adduced by learned men on both sides. We ordered them, when prepared in this way, to meet together in special sessions. These, to the number of twelve, were held under the presidency of one of the cardinals of the Holy Roman Church, appointed by ourselves, and all were invited to free discussion. 
Finally, we directed that the acts of these meetings, together with all other doctrines, should be submitted to our venerable brethren, the cardinals of the same council, so that when all had studied the whole subject and discussed it in our presence, each might give his own opinion. The order for discussing the matter having been determined upon, it was necessary, with a view to forming a true estimate of the real state of the question, to enter upon it, after carefully inquiry as to how the matter stood in relation to the prescription and settled custom of the Apostolic See, the origin and force of which custom it was undoubtedly of great importance to determine. For this reason, in the first place, the principal documents in which our predecessors, at the request of Queen Mary, exercised their special care for the reconciliation of the English Church were considered. Thus, Julius III sent Cardinal Reginald Pole, an Englishman, and illustrious in many ways to be his legate, a la terre, for the purpose, quote, as his angel of peace and love, and gave him extraordinary and unusual mandates or faculties and directions for his guidance. These Paul IV confirmed and explained. And here, to interpret rightly the force of these documents, it is necessary to lay it down as a fundamental principle that they were certainly not intended to deal with an abstract state of things, but with a specific and concrete issue. For since the faculties given by these pontiffs to the apostolic legate had reference to England only, and to the state of religion therein, and since the rules of action were laid down by them at the request of the said legate, they could not have been mere directions for determining the necessary conditions for the validity of ordinations in general. They must pertain directly to providing for holy orders in the said kingdom, as the recognized condition of the circumstances and times demanded. This, besides being clear from the nature and form of said documents, is also obvious from the fact that it would have been altogether irrelevant thus to instruct the legate, one whose learning has been conspicuous in the Council of Trent, as the conditions necessary for the bestowal of the sacrament of order. To all rightly estimating these matters, it will not be difficult to understand why, in the letters of Julius III, issued to the Apostolic Legate on 8th of March, 1554, there is a distinct mention, first of those who, quote, rightfully and lawfully promoted, might be maintained in their orders, and then of others who, quote, not promoted to holy orders, might, quote, be promoted if they were found to be worthy and fitting subjects. For it is clearly and definitely noted, as indeed was the case, that there were two classes of men. The first of those who had really received holy orders, either before the secession of Henry VIII, or if after it, and by ministers infected by error and schism, still according to the accustomed Catholic rite. The second, those who were initiated according to the Edward in Ordinal, who on that account could not be, quote, promoted since they had received an ordination, which was null. That the mind of the Pope was this, and nothing else, is clearly confirmed by the letter of the said legate, dated 29th of January, 1555 subdelegating his faculties to the Bishop of Norwich. Moreover, what the letters of Julius III themselves say about freely using the pontifical faculties, even on behalf of those who had received their consecration, quote, irregularly, minus right, and not according to the accustomed form of the Church, is to be especially noted. By this expression, those only could be meant who had been consecrated according to the Edward and right, since beside it in the Catholic form there was then no other in England. This becomes even still clearer when we consider the legation which, on the advice of Cardinal Pole, the sovereign princes, Philip and Mary, sent to the Pope in Rome in the month of February 1555. The royal ambassadors, three men, quote, most illustrious and endowed with every virtue, of whom one was Thomas Thirlby, Bishop of Ely, were charged to inform the Pope more fully as to the religious condition of the country, and especially to beg that he would ratify and confirm what the legate had been at pains to effect and had succeeded in effecting towards a reconciliation of the kingdom with the church. For this purpose, all the necessary written evidence and the pertinent parts of the new ordinal were submitted to the Pope. The legation having been splendidly received, and their evidence having been diligently discussed by several cardinals after mature deliberation, Paul IV issued his bull Preclare Charismi on June 20th of that same year. In this, whilst giving full force and approbation to what Pole had done, it is ordered in the matter of the ordinations as followed. Those who have been promoted to ecclesiastical orders by anyone but a bishop validly and lawfully ordained are bound to receive those orders again. But those whose bishops are not, quote, validly and lawfully ordained were had been made sufficiently clear by the foregoing documents and the faculties used in the said matter by the legate. Those, namely, who had been promoted to the episcopate as others to other orders, quote, not according to the accustomed form of the church, or as the legate himself wrote to the bishop of Norwich, the form and intention of the church, not having been observed. These were certainly those promoted according to the new form of the rite, to the examination of which the cardinals specially deputed had given their careful attention. Neither should the passage much to the point 
in the same pontifical letter be overlooked, where together with others needing dispensation are enumerated. Those, quote, who had obtained both orders as well as benefices nulliter et de facto. For to obtain orders nulliter means that it's the same act by act null and void, that is invalid, as the very meaning of the word and as common parlance require. This is especially clear when the word is used in the same way about orders as about, quote, ecclesiastical benefices. These, by the undoubted teaching of the sacred canons, were clearly null if given with any vitiating of a defect. Moreover, when some doubted as to who, according to the mind of the pontiff, could be called and considered bishops, validly and lawfully ordained, the said pope sh shortly after, on October 30th, issued a further letter in the form of a brief and said, quote, We, desiring to wholly remove such doubt and to opportunely provide for the peace of conscience of those who during the aforementioned schism were promoted to holy orders by clearly stating the meaning of intention which we had said in our letters declare that it is only those bishops and archbishops who are not ordained and consecrated in the form of the church that can be said cannot be said to be duly and rightly ordained unless this declaration had applied to the actual case of england that is to say the edwardan ordinal pope surely would have done nothing by this last letter for the removal of doubt and the restoration of peace or conscience. Further, it was in this sense that the legate understood the documents and commands of the apostolic see, and duly and conscientiously obeyed them, and the same was done by Queen Mary and the rest who helped to restore Catholicism to its former state. The authority of Julius III and of Paul IV, which we have quoted, clearly shows the origin of that practice which has been observed without interruption for more than three centuries, that ordinations conferred according to the Edwardian rite should be considered null and void. This practice is fully proved by the numerous cases of absolute reordination according to the Catholic rite, even in Rome. In the observance of this practice, we have a proof directly affecting the matter in hand. For if by any chance doubt should remain as to the true sense in which these pontifical documents are to be understood, the principle holds good that, quote, custom is the best interpreter of law. Since in the Church it has ever been a constant and established rule that it is sacrilegious to repeat the sacrament of order, it never could have come to pass that the apostolic see should have silently acquiesced in and to tolerated such a custom. But not only did the apostolic see tolerate this practice, but approved and sanctioned it as often as any particular case arose, which called for its judgment in the matter. We adduce two cases of this kind out of many which have from time to time been submitted to the Supreme Council of the Holy Office. The first was, in 1684, of a certain French Calvinist, and the other, in 1704, of John Clement Gordon, both of whom had received their orders according to the Edwardian ritual. In the first case, after a searching investigation, the consultors, not a few in number, gave in writing their answers, or as they call it, their vota, and the rest unanimously agreed with their conclusion, quote, for the invalid inv validity of the ordination. And only on account of reasons of opportunists did the cardinals deem it well to answer with a delata, not to formulate the conclusion at the moment. The same documents were called into use and considered again in the examination of the second case, and additional written statements of opinion were also obtained from consultors. The most eminent doctors of the Sorbonne and of Dewey were likewise asked for their opinion. No safeguard which wisdom and prudence could suggest to ensure the thorough sifting of the question was neglected. And here it is important to observe that although Gordon himself, whose case it was and some of the consultors, had adduced among the reasons which went to prove the invalidity, the ordination of Parker, according to their own ideas about it, in the delivery of the decision, this reason was altogether set aside as documents of incontestability authentically prove. Nor in pronouncing the decision was weight given to any other reason than the, quote, defect of form and intention. And in order that the judgment concerning this form might be more certain and complete, a precaution was taken that a copy of the Anglican ordinal should be submitted to examination, and that with it it should be collated the ordination forms gathered together with the various Eastern and Western rites. Then Clement XI himself, with the unanimous vote of the ordinals or the cardinals concerned, on Thursday, 17th of April, 1704, decreed, quote, John Clement Gordon shall be ordained from the beginning and unconditionally to all the orders, even holy orders and chiefly a priesthood. And in case he has not been confirmed, he shall first receive the sacrament of confirmation. It is important to bear in mind that this judgment was in no wise determined by the omission of the tradition of instruments, for in such a case, according to the established custom, the direction would have been to repeat the ordination conditionally. And still more important, it is to note that judgment of the pontiff applies universally to all Anglican ordinations, because although it refers to a particular case, it is not based upon any reason special to that case, but upon the defect of form, which defect equally affects all these ordinations, so much so that when similar cases subsequently come up for 
decision, the same decree of Clement XI was quoted as the norm. Hence, it must be clear to everyone that the controversy lately revived had already been de definitely settled by the Apostolic See, and that it is the sufficient knowledge of these documents that we must perhaps attribute to the fact that any Catholic writer should have considered it still an open question. But as we stated in the beginning, there is nothing so deeply and ardently desired as to be of help to men of goodwill by showing them the greatest consideration and charity. Wherefore, we ordered that the Anglican ordinal, which is the essential point of the whole matter, should be once more carefully examined. In the examination of any right for the effecting and administering of sacraments, distinction is rightly made between the part which is ceremonial and which is essential, the latter being usually called the matter and form. All know that the sacraments of the new law, as sensible and efficient signs of invisible grace, ought both to signify the grace which they effect and effect the grace which they signify. Although the signification ought to be found in the whole essential right, that is to say the matter and form still pertains chiefly to the form, since the matter is the part which is not determined by itself, but which is determined by the form. And this appears still more clearly in the sacrament of order. The matter of which, insofar as we have to consider it in the case, is the imposition of hands, which indeed by itself signifies nothing definite and is equally used for several orders and for confirmation. But the words which until recently were commonly held by Anglicans to constitute the proper form of priestly ordination, namely, receive the Holy Ghost, certainly do not in the least definitely express the sacred order of priesthood, or its grace and power, which is chiefly the power of consecrating and of offering the true body and blood of the Lord. See the Council of Trent, Session 23. In that sacrifice, which is no, quote, bare commemoration of the sacrifice offered on the cross. See the same Council of Trent. This form had indeed afterwards added it to it the words for the office and works of a priest, etc., but this rather shows that the Anglicans themselves perceived that the first form was defective and inadequate. But even if this addition could give to the form its due signification, it was introduced too late, as a century had already elapsed since the adoption of the Edwardian Ordinal. For as the hierarchy had become extinct, there remained no power of ordaining. In vain has help been recently sought for the plea of the validity of Anglican orders from the other prayers of the same ordinal. For to put aside other reasons when, when show this to be sufficient for the purpose of the Anglican life, let this argument suffice for all. For them has been deliberately removed whatever sets for the dignity and office of the priesthood in the Catholic rite. The form consequently cannot be considered apt or sufficient for the sacrament, which omits what it ought essentially to signify. The same holds good of Episcopal consecration. For the formula, receive the Holy Ghost, not only were the words for the office and works of a bishop, etc., added at a later period, but even these, as we shall presently state, must be understood in a sense different to which that they bear in the Catholic rite. Nor is anything gained by quoting the prayer of the preface, Almighty God, since it, in like manner, has been stripped of the words which denote the summum sacerdotium. It is not relevant to examine here whether the episcopate be a completion of the priesthood, or an order distinct from it or whether, when bestowed, as they say, per saltum, on one who is not a priest, it has or has not had its effect. But the episcopate, undoubtedly, by the institute of Christ, most truly belongs to the sacrament of order, and constitutes a sacerdotium in the highest degree, namely that which, by the teaching of the Holy Fathers and their liturgical customs, is called the Sumorum Sacerdotium Sacri Ministeri Summa. So it comes to pass that, as the sacrament of order and the true sacerdotium of Christ were utterly eliminated from the Anglican rite, and hence the sacerdotium is in no wise conferred truly and validly in the Episcopal consecration of the same rite, for the like reason. Therefore, the Episcopate can in no wise be truly and validly conferred by it. And this is the more so because among the first duties of the Episcopate is that of ordaining ministers for the Holy Eucharist and sacrifice. For the full and accurate understanding of the Anglican ordinal, besides what we have noted as to some of its parts, there is nothing more pertinent than to consider carefully the circumstances under which it was composed and publicly authorized. It would be tedious to enter into details, nor is it necessary to do so, as the history of that time is sufficiently eloquent as the animus of the authors of the ordinal against the Catholic Church, as the abettors whom they associated with themselves from the heterodox groups, as to the end which they had in view. Being fully cognizant of the necessary connection between faith and worship, between the law of believing and the law of praying, under a pretext of returning to the primitive form, they corrupted the liturgical order in many ways to suit the errors of the reformers. For this reason, in the whole ordinal, not only is there no clear mention of the sacrifice, of consecration, of the priesthood, and of the power of consecrating and offering sacrifice, but as we have just stated, every trace of these things which has been in, in such prayers of the Catholic rite, as they had not entirely rejected, was deliberately removed and struck out. 
In this way, the native character or spirit, as it is called, of the cardinal clearly manifests itself. Hence, if vitiated in its origin, it was wholly insufficient to confer orders. It was impossible that in the course of time it would become sufficient, since no change had taken place. In vain, those who, from the time of Charles I, have attempted to hold some kind of sacrifice or of priesthood, have made additions to the ordinal. In vain also has been the contention of that small section of the Anglican body formed in recent times, that the said ordinal can be understood and interpreted in a sound and orthodox sense. Such efforts, we affirm, have been and are made in vain, and for this reason, that any words in the Anglican ordinal, as now it is, which lend themselves to ambiguity, cannot be taken in the same sense as they possess in the Catholic rite. For once a new rite has been initiated, in which, we, as we have seen, the sacrament of order is adulterated or denied, and from which all idea of consecration and sacrifice has been rejected. The formula, receive the Holy Ghost, no longer holds good, because the Spirit is infused into the soul with the grace of the sacrament. And so the words for the office and works of a priest or bishop, and the like, no longer hold good, but remain as words without the reality which Christ instituted. Many of the more shrewd Anglican interpreters of the ordinal have perceived the force of this argument, and they openly urge it against those who take the ordinal in a new sense, and vainly attach to the orders conferred thereby a value and efficacy which they do not possess. By this same argument is refuted the contention of those who think that the prayer, Almighty God, giver of all good things, which is found at the beginning of the ritual action, might suffice as a legitimate form of orders, even in the hypothesis that it might be held to be sufficient in a Catholic rite approved by the Church. With this inherent defect of form is joined the defect of intention, which is equally essential to the sacrament. The Church does not judge about the mind and intention, insofar as it is something by its nature internal. But insofar as it is manifested externally, she is bound to judge concerning it. A person who has correctly and seriously used the requisite matter and form to effect and confer a sacrament is presumed for that very reason to have intended to do so, what the, ch what the Church does. On this principle rests the doctrine that a sacrament is truly conferred by the ministry of one who is a heretic or unbaptized, provided that the Catholic rite be employed. On the other hand, if the rite be changed with the manifest intention of introducing another rite not approved by the Church, and of rejecting what the Church does, and what by the institution of Christ belongs to the nature of the sacrament, that it is clear that not only is the necessary intention wanting to the sacrament, but that the intention is adverse to and destructive of the sacrament. All these matters have been long and carefully considered by ourselves and by our venerable brethren, the judges of the Supreme Council, of whom it has pleased us to call a special meeting upon the 16th day of July last, the Solemnity of Our Lady of Mount Carmel. They, with one accord, agreed that the question laid before them had been already adjudicated upon with full knowledge of the Apostolic See, and that this renewed discussion and examination of the issues had only served to bring out more clearly the wisdom and accuracy with which that decision had been made. Nevertheless, we deemed it well to postpone a decision, in order to afford time both to consider whether it would be fitting or expedient that we should make a fresh authoritative declaration upon the matter, to humbly pray for a fuller measure of divine guidance. Then, considering that this matter, although already decided, had been by certain persons for whatever reason recalled into discussion, and that thence it might follow that a pernicious error would be foisted in the minds of many who were, might suppose that they possessed the sacrament and effects of orders, where these are in no wise to be found, it seemed good to us in the Lord to pronounce our judgment. Wherefore, strictly adhering in this manner to the decrees of the pontiffs, our predecessors, and confirming them most fully, and as it were, renewing them by our authority, of our own initiative and certain knowledge, we pronounce and declare that ordinations carried out according to the Anglican rite have been and are absolutely null and utterly void. It remains for us to say that even as we have entered upon the elucidation of this grave question in the name and of the love of the Great Shepherd, the same we appeal to those who desire and seek with a sincere heart the possession of a hierarchy and of holy orders. Perhaps until now aiming at the greater perfection of Christian virtue, and searching more devoutly the divine scriptures, redoubling the fervor of their prayers, they have nevertheless hesitated in doubt and anxiety to follow the voice of Christ, which so long has entirely admonished them. Now they see clearly whither he in his goodness invites them and wills them to come. And returning to his only one fold, they will obtain the blessings which they seek, and the consequent helps to salvation, of which he has made the church the dispenser, and as it were the constant guardian and promoter of his redemption amongst the nations. Then indeed they shall draw waters and joy from the fountains of the Lord, his wondrous sacraments, whereby his faithful souls have their sins truly remitted, and are restored to the friendship of God, are nourished and strengthened by the heavenly bread, and abound with the most beautiful, powerful aids for their eternal salvation. May the God of peace, the God of all consolation, in his infinite tenderness, enrich and fill, 
with all these blessings those who truly yearn for them. We wish to direct our exhortation and our desires in a special way to those who are ministers of religion in their respective communities. They are men who take from their very office precedence and learning and authority, and who have at the heart the glory of God and the salvation of souls. Let them be the first in joyfully submitting to the divine call and obey it, and furnish a glorious example to others. Assuredly, with an exceeding great joy, their mother the church will welcome them and will cherish with all her love and care those whom the strength of their generous souls has, amidst many trials and difficulties, led back to her bosom. Nor could words express the recognition which this devoted courage will win for them from the assemblies of the brethren throughout the Catholic world, or what hope or confidence it will merit for them before Christ as their judge, or what reward it will obtain from him in the heavenly kingdom. And we ourselves, in every lawful way, shall continue to promote their reconciliation with the church, in which individuals and masses, as we ardently desire, may find so much for their imitation. In the meantime, by the tender mercy of our Lord God, we ask and beseech all to strive faithfully to follow in the path of divine grace and truth. We decree that these letters and all things contained therein shall not be liable at any time to be impugned or objected to by reason of, or of fault or any other defect whatsoever, or of subreption or obreption of our intention. But ours shall always be valid and in force, and shall be inviolably observed both juridically and otherwise, by all whatsoever degree and pre preeminence, declaring null and void anything which, in these matters, may happen to contrarywise attempted, whether wittingly or unwittingly, by any person whatsoever, by whatsoever authority or pretext, all things to the contrary notwithstanding. We will that there shall be given copies of these letters, even printed, provided that they be signed by a notary and sealed by a person constituted in ecclesiastical dignity, the same credence that would have been given to the expression of our will by showing of these presents. Given at Rome, at St. Peter's, in the year of the Incarnation of our Lord, 1896, on the Ides of September in the 19th year of our pontificate, Pope Leo XIII. Clear? Perhaps, perhaps not. But he has said basically they lack form and in the correct intention, they have the correct form and the correct substance to be valid orders. And as I said at the start, many Anglican priests over the years have actually sought the um, ordination, the sacrament of ordination, the Catholic sacrament from schismatic groups, various groups that aren't worth really worth mentioning here, that have broken off from unity with the Holy See but still possess valid orders. Many Anglicans have sought that, including a few of their bishops even. So now the question is, of course, muddied. <laughs> I'm curious what you thought of that, especially in light of the Anglican priests and uh, Lady Bishop offering the quote-unquote mass at St. John Lateran last week. So let me know in the comments, please. Like and subscribe if you haven't. It does help, as does sharing this on social media. That helps a lot, too. As always, pray for the church. I'm Anthony Stein. Ave Maria.